super excited to have Kevin Kreider with us. Had the pleasure of meeting him on The Traders. You may know him from Bling Empire on Netflix. He's involved in a lot of different productions, which we're all going to find out as we move on in the podcast. Before we get into that, though, Kevin, it's so good to see you, man. How's life? You too, man. A lot's changed since New York, you know? <laughs> a lot's changed from New York, a lot's changed from Scotland. But heading into this, this was your first reality TV competition show, The Traders. What did you, what, what surprised you about the experience? Uh, what surprised me about this experience, Dan, is like the intensity of like how short we got to film everything. Like that was that, that was that your experience on Big Brother at all? Like three weeks to film everything? No, I mean, it was very tight, but in comparison for you for Bling Empire, what was the, how was it apples to oranges? Yeah. So Bling Empire, we literally had almost a year to film everything because during the season, we'd have pickup shots where you can come in for like an interview. If uh, let's just say I said, hey, look, I'm going to be on this cool show to call The Traders. You want to like come and film it. Production would come and film my experience on another show or meeting you for the first time or something. So it was like a whole year experience spread in um, a whole year, like eight episodes, whereas like the traders is 11 episodes we have in three weeks. So you can imagine like it's just like literally just getting thrown in and I'm just like, uh, let me just go with this. <laughs> what was for you Bling Empire was when you were filming all these segments, I mean, if you're filming over a year down to eight episodes, there had to be a lot on the cutting room floor, right? So much, man. I mean, like, look, I thought traders had a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor, but Bling Empire, oh my gosh, so much, especially in season two and three, because in season two and three, we actually paused for about a month um, because we we went through a... a I would reset a little bit, actually. Like the producers weren't very happy with um, what was going on. We were actually in the middle of the pandemic. That's why. So we couldn't film a lot of things in like outdoor traveling, nothing. So the the producers were like, you know what? Let's take a pause. Let's breathe a little bit. Come back to this. And when we did, we like hit the ground running. But all the stuff that we filmed before that, it was like six weeks. Almost all of it didn't make the make the cut. So, and I want to give a little context here. So people have never seen it. Bling Empire is just essentially it's like your, how much of it is your reality, like your life and how much of it is like accentuated, like played up events. No, it's definitely 80, 20 rule, I guess. It's like 20% of it is, is totally make believe, but like the 80% is like really these people's lives. I mean, you can see it on their socials. Like they still buy these ridiculous Louis Vuitton, they'll throw like the most extravagant birthday parties. You go, they go to Paris every single, every single three weeks just to go to walk the runway and meet all these designers. And dude, it's wild. But like where it's not real is the sense of um, where, where it's like smashed all in like a short period of time. Like we're really seeing the best in a very quick period of time in everybody's life. Whereas like, in real life, it's just spread out. And, and you don't know when someone's going to throw a big birthday party or go to Disneyland and just shut Disneyland down. So you talk about Bling Empire being like all these, you know, opulent characters, ton of wealth. Like how, how did that show get pitched to you? How did you get in? Because you and I have met and, you know, I thought we connected pretty well. And, and part of this, like you're, you're very real and authentic. Not that those things are not real and authentic, but that didn't seem like it was a part of your MO and who you are. So how did you end up on a show that's only about that or primarily about that? So uh, I'm not too sure how much your fans are Asian and not, but about seven years ago, there wasn't really much um, Asian content out there. I mean, obviously after Bling Empire, uh, I'm so sorry, it was Crazy Rich Asians that really took the stage. Now we see so many TV shows and movies on the Oscars, Emmys, uh, reality TV space, um, even me on Traders. Like you see more Asians on TV now. Uh, but this is before all of that. And I did a lot of speaking TED Talks on just how we're not actually in TV or we're not even in the dating sites or represent, represented very well. Um, and so when I went on stage, started speaking about it, a lot of the producers were like, hey, we have a show idea. 
do you uh, like reality TV? I was like, nah, I've never really done reality TV before. I'm an actor. And they're like, well, why don't you come out, meet the producers, meet the people? And I did. And uh, they quickly became my friends. And then they went out and started pitching it. And it was like, we really were friends for about six months to a year before we actually started filming and doing everything. Friends with the producers or friends with oh, the castmates? Good clarification. Friends with the castmates. The cast was, uh, man, the cast was a real friend group. Like they've known each other for about five or six years before I even came into the picture. And then when I came into the picture, I got to know everybody really quickly. But then again, that's the part that's not quite so real because like these friends never hung out as much as we did when we were filming. I mean, kind of like us, right? Like as yeah. traders, we don't really live in a castle and hang out all the time and do this stuff, you know? Um, but that's that's the magic and the reality of it all. So were you you were plugged into this friend group from the producers before filming? Or how, how did that interaction kind go down? Of. So it's weird. Okay, the, I don't want to confuse people, but like when I did th those talks, a lot of people from LA reached out to me. I lived in Philadelphia at the time. And then they said, hey, come out to LA. I have a music video I want to shoot with you. Oh, I want you to come speak here. Oh, I want you to film a documentary there. So like I ended up going to LA for uh, two weeks, three weeks. And in between that time is when I met the cast who are my friends now. And then it led into the production of it all. And then I just made the move and just never went back to Philly. So let me rewind then. So prior to doing the Ted talk that, that blew up, I was watching that we were talking about before you came on. What were you doing in Philadelphia? Because I knew that's where you grew up. But what were you? Doing? I was trying to back in Philly. I was trying to figure my life again. <laughs> I mean, like I was literally just getting out of credit card debt. Uh, I mean, I was really deep in. I just turned thirty. I had no idea what I was doing with my life. I was like, I'm a washed up wannabe actor. Can't even make a role. Uh, I just got my hair back. I lost my hair from alopecia areata. I was just getting sober. And I was thinking about actually moving to Asia to try to restart my life and career. And then this opportunity came up and I was like, man, let me see where it goes. I got nothing to lose. So when you, you know, said you're 30, you, you had alopecia, you're starting to get sober. What happened prior to that? What were you doing in Philadelphia for, say, like 25 to 30 or 22 to 30? So I was I was up in I was in Philadelphia up until I was 25. And then from 25 till around 30 is when I was in New York City. That's when I studied acting. I got into modeling. Um, I pursued a career. But then I also got into, you know, a lot of alcohol and that was fun. But then it didn't get fun. And then when I was trying to get sober is when I started to lose all of my hair. Like I just couldn't manage my life at the time. And so you know, very stressful time in my life because, like I said, I wasn't working, wasn't doing any modeling or acting. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life if this didn't work out. And so I came back to Philadelphia, still contemplating what to do with my life, was doing personal training for a little bit, and then um, got sober. And all of a sudden, this whole new life started to work out for me in Los Angeles. All right, I want to rewind a little bit because you said you had alopecia and I know earlier that's from like it was stress induced for you, and like yeah. right now, I mean, you got like you got great salad, you know, you got a great head of hair. Were you were you like cue ball or was it like patchy or what did it look like? Super patchy. So like right here, like I still sometimes look around here to see if it's still there, but it would start. It started right here, like literally whole chunk of hair, and then it just didn't stop. Like almost this whole side was gone right here, like. Facial hair, leg hair, eyebrows, all of it was disappearing. And it was from this, was it from the stress of not knowing where your next job was going to come from? Just a lot going on, you know, life spiraling type thing or just everything? 100%. And like, like I said, I, I knew I had a, a problem with drugs and alcohol. So yeah. it was like very stressful in my life when I was trying to quit. And then I had to face all the financial issues and then career, um, living situations. It was just a big ball of mess at that time was there a moment that you remember or like okay this is it i have to stop drinking and doing drugs was there like how does that because i'm sure that's not an easy battle but is there a, a rock bottom moment where you're like i can't do this yeah actually the rock bottom moment was 2015 and i um 
I was dating the girlfriend that I have now. Uh, and, and she didn't know it at the time. I was like, ah, oh, she's a one. And, and, but the thing is I was still drinking at the time and didn't know how to stop. And then after about nine months, when we broke up, I was like, okay, this is my rock bottom. Like, I don't want this experience to happen again. Uh, I knew I had a lot of problems. I knew I was most likely undateable. And so I was like, uh, I think I need to take care of myself. So I got sober then. So then you, did you move back home to Philadelphia? And then what was that? I was like? already home in Philadelphia at the time. Okay. Um, I was going back and forth to New York City and Philly to do modeling and do, do acting at the time. Because uh, I just couldn't afford to live in New York anymore. I mean, Dan, I was in like a 250 square foot apartment in Philly. Like barely being able to pay rent at that time. And so working at a gym again. Um, and it was just... Like I said, just trying to get my life back in order. Was there any, was there any consideration for you to move back home, like the, with with the family, or was that not an option for you? Oh no, I mean it was. It, to me, it was an option. For my dad, it wasn't an option. <laughs> what do you say? It's like no, you got to figure this out. Yeah, like literally when I first moved back in, in Philly, I moved back with my dad, and I spent about three or four months with him. And I remember when he came home, it was like late at night, I was on the computer. He came in and he's like, you have one month to get out. And I was like, like for real? Like it's only been three months. He's like, well, you're not doing anything. You have to get out there. And you ha like, I don't care where you go. It's just not here. Um, and he said the word that really hit me, which is like, I am not going to enable you to just live and continue to live like this. And I was like, wow, like I really respect my dad from that because I think most parents would just be like, oh, he'll figure it out. Let me just keep a roof over. Or like Asian parents are even better. They're like, my son's home, you know, like this is great. Like not my dad though. In, in the moment, were you like angry or did it hit you like? Oh, it hit me. I was like, okay, I have nowhere to go. Like I have to figure out what I want to do. Who do I know in Philly? What's the easiest way to make some money? I ended up sleeping um, at my friend, or not even my friend, sorry. It was my cousin's friends, like college friends' house. And um, I squatted there for a little bit, but still paid rent. And it was in the middle of a town that was upcoming in Philly. It's called Fishtown, but it's, it's, it's great now. But I'm talking about like, this is 10 years ago, right? Um, living with my cousin's friends, barely being able to pay rent, restarting as a personal trainer at a gym and working at a gym part-time just to be able to pay off all my debt, my rent. And this happened for about a year and a half. And so like finances were like very tight and I was just trying to figure it out. I didn't have enough money to go back to acting school, move back to New York. Then I was like, at this point, should I even be an actor? Like that, that went through my head a lot. So, so you're grinding, you're paying off debt. And then at what point do you start to like figure it out? Cause then you have this Ted talk. I mean, that's a huge jump from like squatting on a couch to giving a Ted talk. Yeah. Like, how no, then, like, seriously, I like, it seems like it just happened overnight, but it didn't. It's like, um, back in Philly then it's like getting sober. That really helped a lot because then it didn't feel like anything really happened in my first year of sobriety. I was just getting better. Right. Like I was not drinking. I was thinking clear. I slowly started to realize, oh, crap, my money was really going out the toilet, you know, like dr drinking and eating, eating out a lot. So I was able to get a lot of money back, pay off all the debt. And then I realized, oh, wow, this is a better life for me. <laughs> like I'm responsible now. What did you notice about yourself personally? Like when you stopped drinking, what are some things you noticed about yourself that were for the absolute better? So one thing I noticed from the drinking is that it, it is a numbing agent, right? Like I literally become more loose. I'm intoxicated or I'm hungover, right? Or I spend a lot of time drinking and laughing with friends. And what I realize is if I don't have drinking, I have to deal with my emotions. And then when I realized what my emotions and I gained a lot more of emotional intelligence since I stopped drinking, I realized, oh, shit, like. I I don't know how to live like a man. I don't know how to live in this world. What do you mean? And, what does that mean? 
it's like I, it like stunned my maturity. You know, it's like I was still doing college fratty things back then. And it's just like it's very, very different, Kevin, that, you know, now, like now I'm a lot more, you know, I think respectable. No, you're <laughs> very like, put like, to no, very put together, I would say. And, you know, yeah. And I'm not like doing bongs anymore. I'm not going out to like clubs and bars and doing all that stuff and dance on the tables. Like it's very different, Kevin, now. And I realized like, man, I am 30. I don't have my life together and it's because I'm making bad decisions. And then once I was able to really realize like, what do I want to do in life? And I was like, Oh, let me go back to where it came from. I wanted Asian guys to be on the map for entertainment, acting, dating, everything, you know, cause it's like me growing up, I was the only Asian guy in, in my class most of the time. And I just knew that I had a story to tell and then I just so happened to find the story that to tell on stage, on TED Talks, on reality shows. When did you, when did that become important to you? Was it at like when you were a kid, a teenager? When did that being able to tell your story or have someone like you in entertainment? You're, was there a moment or? Yeah, definitely. Definitely a moment. Like I, I still remember, man, I remember watching, I, it sounds really weird. It's like, I remember watching like Bruce Lee the karate kid. And I was like, yeah, it's cool. But like, I don't know martial arts, you know? And then um, I still remember at that time, I was like, oh, why aren't there like sexy Asian guys getting the girls? Why is it the pizza boy or they're made fun of and stuff? And why do I feel like, you know, girls always tell me, oh, I don't date Asian guys, you know? Um, by the way, that's not even my case anymore, right? And it's not the case anymore. I'm just going through the past experiences. But I knew at that time, I was like, oh, I have a story to tell. I have a mission. And I think you and I share the same commonality. I hid in comic books for a long time. And it's weird, like with comic books, card gaming, what I loved it was, it was the escape. But then when it wasn't seen cool... I didn't have that anymore. I didn't have that escape. I didn't have that like comfort. And then I dealt with like, oh shoot, like I gotta get into sports, you know? And um, I gotta get into drinking. And it was like the worst thing for me actually. So when, when you're growing up, cause you were adopted, you were born in Korea. Like who would you talk to about this as a kid or as a teenager? You said everyone in your class, there are no other Asian kids. Like who would yeah. you talk to about this stuff or you just wouldn't? Well, I try, I try to look, I sound more articulate now because I'm used to sharing my story. I got a therapist, I, you know, like, um, and I, I just I do a lot more podcasts and speaking about it. But back then I had no idea how to articulate my feelings. I would just like be this typical high school kid. It's like, oh, she doesn't like me because I'm an Asian guy. You know, she only dates white guys. And by the way, she's white, you know, like, I didn't know what to articulate. So I would just take it so personally and it would affect my self-esteem. And then the other guys would really try to comfort me and be like, you know, make other jokes or, you know, the, the, the side joke that um, uh, white guys would like my friends would tell me who are white, they'd say, well, you're not really Asian, you know? And at the time it felt okay. I didn't really understand, but I was like, Oh, they're basically saying it is better to be white, you know, like, because you're not really Asian. So let me ask this. So just to rewind. So say you're a teenager now and, you know, you go up to a girl and she says, I don't date Asian guys. There's an Asian teenager listening to this now. Like, how, how do you deal with that? Like, if there's like a, you know, 15 year old Asian dude right now and he just hears that, what do you like? What did you learn that you'd be like, hey, dude, I want you to hear this so you can learn and, and manage this like I didn't have the yeah. chance to. I would tell her, I would tell this Asian guy, your comeback is, well, you're missing out. <laughs> it's, it's, you're just missing out. But then also you have the confidence to say that too. Like, you know, like when you say right. that, you're like, yeah, there's no doubt in what you're saying. No doubt. And like, here's the thing too. Like, here's my new perspective in life. She's a white girl. To say she doesn't date Asian guys is kind of normal. Like, a white guy, like I noticed this, right? It's like it's interracial dating is more of a newer thing and it's happening more and more. If you live in a minority world, like where uh, I'm the only Asian guy, and to expect all white girls to date Asian guys, that's kind of unrealistic too. 
Like nowadays, I do prefer to date Asian girls. But when I'm a young kid, I can't really expect a 10 year old to be able to articulate that to an Asian guy. Like, look, I, I, they have to be pretty woke, right? Like to say like, hey, you know, I think you're attractive, but you know, I actually prefer to just date like a young Jewish professional or something like that. Or like, you know what I mean? They're just not that articulate. They just literally say, I just don't date Asian guys, you know? Um, I would tell Asian guys, don't take it personally. Like it's a, it's a very normal thing. Like you wanting to date a white girl, sure, it's great, it's fine. I think it's really unrealistic for you to expect other people to only be so wide open and open-minded like you, you know what I mean? It's just not the norm. Yeah. I mean, I, it's just, it's fascinating to me because here you are, like you've gone through this and now like you have a totally different perspective. You've essentially a thought leader in this and, and, you know, a lot of people look to you and just to be able to share that, like, you know, I have no clue what that's like at all, but that, but that's what the, it's, that's what it's like. I'm, I'm picturing like a kid listening to this and it's like, yeah. what do I do? You know, and, yeah, and also too, like to me, it, it's not to deny that racism and preference doesn't exist. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, though, for your own confidence and personality and your mental psyche, like don't do your best not to take it personally. Know your worth. Know that you're cool. Know that being Asian's cool. And it really is much cooler now than it was back then. So I can't imagine what it's like today. It's probably much cooler. And then um, I look at somebody like you in your small town, right? Like you live in a small town. I mean, how many Asians are really in your town? I, you know, that's a great question. I don't know. And I'd, I'd have to look at the census, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know. But the thing is, though, like it's only very normal for Asians to be on the coasts, you know, like in um, and I think it's like Wisconsin, not Wisconsin, Michigan, because that's where a lot of adoptees are from. But like, you know, people don't see it. They don't know anything better. You know, and I think it's that's why it's so cool to see TV, media and Netflix. Everybody's got access to it. Everybody has access to getting into the lives of Asians now. Traders, right? Bling Empire. We get to see people like me and with you and with others. You know, it, it's a it's a new world now. And and so really for you, like the watershed moment that what you said was when crazy rich Asians came out, like that was a massive success. But you noticed <laughs> from that. It was, were you treated differently? Did you get more callbacks or like, what did you, what changed oh, for you after that? Everything changed after that. Everything. Uh, managers reach out. They want you to be an actor. You get more auditions for sure. Like I said, I was tied up with Bling Empire for a while. So that was, I mean, focus point in my life. Like all of a sudden you're seeing more people say like to me, oh, I watch K-pop, you know, like it's it's kind of funny now to hear it, but it's like, that's how they were trying to relate to me. Um, I have all these new opportunities, you know, it's like somebody like myself being on a show like The Traders, right? Like that was, that wouldn't have happened, I don't think, without something like Crazy Rich Asians happening. And because I'm so far removed from the Hollywood and all that stuff works, is that just because it took a success to break that like door down? Or I, I don't know. I it, well, it's opinion. weird because we do talk about it. There was a, a movie called The Joy Luck Club that happened a long time ago. I think it was in the 80s. It did very well. It was an all-female Asian cast. Um, but what ended up happening is it took a long time for another all-Asian movie to come out. And then finally, Crazy Rich Asians. And I think it was just such a big success that studios were like, oh, Asians want to watch Asian TV and movies as well. And they want to see themselves on TV and film. I don't think people knew that before. I thought, I think the stereotype was Asians only want to be doctors and lawyers or good at education. I think that was really what people thought in Hollywood. And then when they saw something like Crazy Rich Asians, they're like, oh, that's not true. So I think it just blew open the doors for everybody. So, okay. So I'm going to fast forward slash rewind a little bit. So you're in Philadelphia and things are starting to move, but how do you get on this TEDx talk? Like what, what steps led up to that? Cause it just, it, you didn't go from like crowd surfing to starting uh, personal fitness again and then end up on a TED talk stage. Yeah. So this is kind of risky, but um, there was this guy named Jeremy Lin. Uh, he was a famous basketball yeah, player. Yeah. You remember Sandy, him? Yeah. Sandy. It was nuts. He like went all like 50 point games, like killing it for the Knicks. Yeah. Totally. It's huge. 
So he was um, playing in Philadelphia and I got a backstage pass to go meet him with a bunch of other people. How did you get a backstage? Um, it was through friends of mine. They were like, hey, look, you 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 want to come? I was like, yes, but I need a favor. And so the favor was from my friend, you need to film this segment of the Q&A section that I want to ask Jeremy. And were you in like the press room or was it something totally separate? It was like a press room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where all the but reporters like, was, are and stuff? No, it wasn't even reporters. It's just for – it was in a press room but for – a certain group of Asian fans okay. only, you know? Gotcha. Um, and so we were in there and my friend took a video for me and the video, literally, you can still find it online. I asked Jeremy Lin if uh, he ever came across the stereotypes that Asian men weren't sexy. And then he riffed off of it. He's like, yeah, it's definitely something that's true. And basically it's not something that's really spoken that about. That super viral. That one very viral I feel back like then. I yeah. saw that. Like I, you know, I can't picture, but I'm like, I may have watched this or saw a clipping or a headline about yeah. it. So, if, like, there's lots of headlines that came afterwards. There's lots of videos. Um, and and what was cool is they didn't change the video much. Like I was still in it, um, and I'd be linked into the article. And then from there, um, it went into Ted. TEDx reached out and then I got on there and then Huffington Post videos and then many more. And then that's where the whole uh, the Netflix thing reached out. And uh, the producers that, that got us on Netflix, they reached out and I was in L.A. and hanging out with the cast. But it actually came from one of the cast. Sorry, I should take that back. It's like from one of my friends that I met while I was in L.A. who became my castmate. That's when the producer uh -huh. they introduced me to the producers but realistically i mean if we're like getting super like granular that you asking that question was a domino that affected your life forever <laughs> never it, it, it changed my life forever like i'm telling you like it was weird i dan i remember being at my computer desk knowing like should i upload this like this is a very controversial topic at the time Nobody was really doing it or talking about. It. Plus, it's Jeremy Lin. I didn't. I don't want to disrespect them, you know. Yeah. Um. I was like, no, man, this has to go up. I was very hesitant, and I remember hitting it, and like an hour later, it got like twenty k views, and I was like, wow, an hour. This is the best content I ever put out. Literally, like the next day, there's an article from like NBA or something, and I was like, wow, this is something special going on. That's incredible. I mean, just to think how one thing you do affects your entire life. So then you end up getting on Bling Empire, you know, and you, we talked about this over dinner, but you would tell me you would go out well, while Bling Empire is on, you'd go out and you would get not harassed, but people would be like interrupting dinner. And what, tell, <laughs> what's the like brevity? What's the not the brevity is the right word. What's how big was this show when it was on? Uh, just to put it in context, too, this came out in the middle of the pandemic when the show came out in 2021. So people were locked up and people were watching everything. And it was the first all Asian American show on Netflix for reality TV or actually even a television show that um, Netflix produced. It was an original. And so immediately when I went to a cafe, first of all, you have to realize there's not many people around. So like now it's the hustle and bustle. People are all around. Um it was very, I was very easily identified, you know, and it became one of these things. Like I couldn't even have coffee sitting down. I couldn't, I couldn't eat without being interrupted or people wanting photos at the time. Uh, plane rides, you know, it's like oh, the, the, the flight attendants were all on it. And it's like, it was pretty wild, man. I find that fascinating. What I find fascinating is your reaction to that. So you go from like, essentially no one, no one knows who you are to after the pandemic, you go out your life's different. How did you deal with that? It's really funny because um, it's funny because at the time it feels really good because you're like, oh, people are watching my show. <laughs> like you like that. Yeah. Like, if nobody's doing that, you're like, is anybody even watching this show? <laughs> but then it gets to the point where you're like, wow, this is so much to handle. Will this last forever? <laughs> like, how am I going to live my life? Like you, you start, you start going, thinking too far ahead. You're like, should I get a bodyguard? Like, should, like, am I going to have to be locked up in an apartment all the time? Should I change my address? And you're like, no, it's not. It's like, people just want photos. I mean, dude, I remember there was a time when I was walking close to my house and people 
recognized me from behind <laughs> and drove by and started yelling, yo, Kevin. There was a time, Dan, I had a face mask on and people just, and a hoodie on, and people recognized me from my walk. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was really a wild time. Like, And so I think what really ruined it a little bit for me and and this is nothing against my fans it's just how big it was back then it was the intensity it was just like all the time being interrupted walking around um and i don't know if you've ever experienced that but it's like yeah no. <laughs> like you can't go anywhere without people wanting you to like say happy birthday or send a message to people on their videos. And you're like, man, I just, I just want to like pick up a hot dog or something. I don't even <laughs> eat a hot dog. I want to pick up a vegan hot dog or something <laughs> like. So then, okay. So this is like, so it's, it's going well, bling empire is going well. And then there's some negotiation stuff and then the show doesn't renew. So it goes from, Hey, you're riding high. Everything's cruising to you get the call. What, what's the call like and then what's your next thoughts man good question uh so we did three seasons so the first call before we filmed season two and three was amazing riding high expectations were like it's gonna be so big it's gonna be like the kardashians right <laughs> then you try to start setting up your life and then after season two and three you start to notice oh you know like you don't gain as many followers it's not as crazy as it was during the pandemic. Then you get the call. I was right here at my kitchen table with my girlfriend, Devon, and um, get the call from the producer. And, and the first thing he said to me is like, I don't have good news. They canceled our show. And I was just heartbroken. I mean, cause like I poured my life into this, like my whole life led up to this, right? Um, and I thought we, I did this show proud as much as I could. And I thought I represented myself very well. And I loved bringing my story of sobriety, adoption, being a newcomer to Los Angeles, finding love again with Devon. I thought it was beautiful. And so I was really hoping the audience would too, but it turned out that, you know, viewership declined, which I found out through Netflix, that's actually very normal. You know, to get past three seasons is extreme hurdle. Um, for a reality show like ours. And so when we had that, I was like, oh man, I felt so bad because uh, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I, I promised Devon, who came back into my life, a, a second chance, not just that love, but like, hey, we can we can make it out here. You know, we have a shot. And then that moment felt like I lied. You know what I mean? I was like, what are we going to do? <laughs> yeah. What do you and then, do? Like when your show gets you yeah, I know. And then that's the thing. It's like, you know, Devon and I, like, we don't sit around. We went into action. Like, uh, I had a few things lined up, like, you know, that I was already doing. Like I told you, like, before I had a beverage company that was up and running. I had a comic book original with Webtoon that was going to come out sometime. I just didn't know when I was in production, you know. I and had we, a clothing and, line. And being on the show amplifies that, amplifies your reach, your potential distribution, free marketing. Exactly. So, so then real quick for context because everyone i don't say everyone else on the show but everyone else on the show it's not i don't want to say it's not a big deal but financially it's not a big deal for them if oh it's not a big deal at all for them but for you like it's your livelihood right totally and that's that was the difference it's like this show didn't happen like they could have literally i mean they could have actually paid for the whole show and it wouldn't have mattered to them you know um, but the thing is though, for, for me, it was my livelihood. It was, uh, something that wasn't just fun, but it was meaningful and it was a jump off from my career and a sustainable way for my career. Um, and it was taken away, you know, and, and by the way, rightfully so, like if the viewership declines, like I don't agree paying for like Netflix shouldn't pay for a show, yeah. but, um, it really was heart wrenching. Cause I was like, oh my gosh, I have all these things that I still want to do that I don't have the platform. So I, you know, you go into this stage where you freak out a little bit where you're like, what am I going to do? You start operating out of fear more than like, Oh, you know, like things are going to work out. Um, but I'll tell you where my life changes when I got the call for traders. So, so you're saying real quick, you said you like, did you take any action out of fear or you just, your mind's racing and like, Hey, how are we going to get through this? That type of situation? 
Yeah, your mind's racing. Like when I mean actions out of fear, it's like it, it, it actually really took a toll on me and the bonds relationship for a little while. You know, it's like we started reacting differently to each other. Like we were really kind of feeling, at least I was, I will tell you what, I was like feeling very like, oh my gosh, like putting my head against the wall, spending late nights trying to raise money for my beverage company, like trying to figure out where we're going to, you know, be okay for a little bit, looking at my finance to make sure we had enough in the bank, which we do, you know, I'm very happy about that. Um, And then just trying to figure out, oh, if I don't do this, where can I go next? And actually, I call my agent. He really, rest me assured, he's like, actually, I think this is a good thing. Because he's like, you're tied up with bling. This will open you up to do more now. And I actually kind of really agreed with him at that point. I was like, yeah, it does open me up, doesn't he? He's like, yeah, now I can go anywhere with you. <laughs> so. So then, okay, so you have these things rolling. Then you get the call to the traders. And yeah. at that point, like. Is it call your agent? They call you, or how did that play out? Yeah, actually, uh, I don't want to incriminate myself, but like, like my manager, my acting manager at the time. This is a little bit of a weird rock bottom moment. Um, he let he let me go as an actor. Um, why? Like, what is? <laughs> why does he do something like that? Or why does your manager do that? This is in the middle of the strike that happened the SAG strike, the WGA strike. And he's like, yo, our company is downsizing. Um, so we have to cut the fat and, you know, you're into reality TV. So he's like, you, you should be okay. You know, like I'm only your acting agent. So felt really defeated. And then I got a call from my other manager um, and I got traders like literally 20 minutes after he, he let me go. <laughs> and I was like, wow, if that wasn't like God watching out after me, I have no idea. Um, and actually I remember looking at the bond cause she was with me when that happened. I was like, I think things are going to be okay. <laughs> was when you got the call from the traders, was it an automatic? Yes. Was it like, let me Google what this is. Had you known in the show? It wasn't an automatic. Yes. I said, I, you know, I said, I said like, yes, but let me watch this first. And then Devon and I watched the show and we we're like, this is a, fuck yeah, no. like, <laughs> come on. Look at look at look at the show, right, Dan? I mean, wasn't that a f- yeah? Once you saw it, <laughs> yeah, no, it was a great. Like, I got an email to go on the first one. I just deleted. It. I'm like, I don't know what this is. Like, I just deleted it, and then you see it. You're like, okay, this is not what you typically see out of reality TV, and it, you felt the same way. Felt exactly the same way. I mean, but here's the thing. I think it was because it's so well theatrically done by Alan, too, our host. Right? I think it made it very extra special. And also too, knowing that it was going to be all like past winners and celebrities and athletes. I was like, okay, they're leveling up. Now it's my time to level up and be on a show like this. So what, are, what were your initial reactions? Like think of like the first couple days, like on set filming. Do you remember how you felt? Like this is a good idea. It's yeah. a bad idea. This is cool. This is crazy. Uh, like actually when I got it, remember getting out of the Jeeps, I think you were with me in the first Jeep, yeah, right? You, you came in, like you were like in the trunk of the Jeep. I'm like, what the <laughs> heck is going on? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm like, why don't I have a seat? <laughs> like, why am I in this trunk? And then my next thought was like, who are these people? So you guys started sharing who you were. I was like, I was like, oh, shit, I think I'm in trouble. These guys know what they're doing in here. I was like, I'm coming in the back of the Jeep thinking I'm going to be the best trader. And then I see you guys, I'm like, oh, man, I don't know if I'm going to be a good trader. Like, I actually thought, I was like thinking at one point, I was like, this is a bad idea. <laughs> so you get in, and then as filming goes on, do you, when you, like, would go down, when you lay your head down at night, you're like, okay, this is cool. Like, I get it. Or, you know, what can you go back and think about any of those thoughts or how you felt about being in it at the moment? Yeah, you know what I thought at some points is like, let me just get through this day because I literally am trying to learn everything. I, I like, I, I'm telling you Dan. I'm like, you know, we get a handbook, we get to talk to people. I'm like, this is my first time having a game as hard as magic, the gathering back then, you know, like, you know how long that took to learn, like, but the, to actually learn this game from scratch, even though I saw it, there's, you know, there's probably new rules. I, I need to figure out how to actually play the game the best way. It was so different and it took a lot of mental bandwidth for me. I was literally going to bed a little bit overwhelmed and also too, like just so much stress of like, who, who's, what's going to happen, you know? 
what um what, so you're feeling overwhelmed what are some takeaways for you in terms of because i feel like when we go back and watch it we all have a totally different perspective but in the moment like are there things that you learned about yourself in this chaos and a lot of uncertainty that you didn't know prior to competing yeah, in the I, think the, I think the one thing i learned about myself is that like <sighs> Okay, I think the one thing I learned is like, hey, man, it's okay in real life, kind of like to be friends with traders. You know what I mean? Like in real life, it's okay. They're still cool. We can have great conversations like with me and you, right? I was like, yeah, you were you were murdering people, but it's okay. We were still having a good time and you didn't murder me. So like. <laughs> but did you, did you like still- when you. When you found out you got murdered, did, was there an element of like, were you angry at, no? No, uh, dude, <laughs> you weren't there. You never would be, mur- but you really do feel like you got hit in the heart. Like you're just like, oh, like there's a moment where your breath is taken away. Um, and, and I was just like, wow, okay, this is real. And, and there's a little bit of denial, like a little bit of denial where you're like, when you see that letter and you're like, Nah, they're going to recruit me, you know? <laughs> I'm saved. <laughs> Did, was there anything for you when you're playing it? Are you like, okay, like I would do another reality TV competition show or would you felt like this is like a one-time thing for you and and you're done? It would have to be a pretty special show again. I think I remember talking to you after one of the um, nights and I was just like, man, I don't know if I'm really made for this, you know, like, the competitions are hard. There's no sleep. I'm, I'm, tr- I, I'm, I think I'm being tricked very easily. And actually, I was because I was sitting next to you, talking to you the whole time, thinking like, "Nah, this guy's just quiet, right? Like, there's no reason why he's a traitor." <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, in some of those down moments, like you and I, I felt like that's when we bonded. Like we, we both found out we like Magic the Gathering. And to me, I like, I look at those down moments as kind of like. The more special moments to me because it was for a mm-hmm. second where it's like okay we're all pros the cameras are off but we're still able to just interact and you know and and get to know each other because i always looked at it like we're never going to be here again this group is never going to be in scotland such a once in a lifetime thing so for you what about competing on the traders did you find most difficult i agree with you i think those those moments i really take up to heart like i mean uh before i answer your question i remember having a moment of bananas when mm-hmm. we did the first mission and it was just like waiting for us to go to the jeep and he's like yo ain't this something and i was like looking around i was like yeah this is something you know yeah. um but conversely too those down moments were also the hardest for me because there was a lot of downtime mm-hmm. um in between like shooting the first episode that i think we really wanted to get into the game right away You know, we wanted to find out who everybody was, the traders. We wanted to talk game. And I think the downtime without actually being able to play the game was like really hard for a lot of us because we really were into it, right? Like you saw a lot of people and it was like to not be able to play the game during the downtime was really tough. Yeah. And just for context, what Kevin's talking about is when the cameras weren't on or when we were waiting for something to get set up. We weren't allowed to talk about the game because anything Kevin and I were talking about about the game wasn't filmed. It'd be a total waste and we couldn't use it. So like there was a lot of time when we're in this room wanting to talk about what's going on, but we just couldn't because of it would have made for, for bad television. So it, like what is have you found comparing, I guess comparing or not, your the response to you being on this show? Like was it, how has the feedback been for you on this show? The response is actually kind of weird. Uh, Like, I think a lot of my fans who knew me from Bling were like a little disappointed because they're like, you know, I'm just used to having so much personality of my own personal story. Like a lot of Bling Empire fans said one thing, which is like, I brought a lot of heart to a superficial world um, because I told real stories. I was the real person on on in this crazy world. Um, And I think with traders, it was like I was very much like muted for only a participant in the game which is a totally different skill, by the way. Like I, I had a little bit of a harder time adjusting to just play the game, talk to these people and play the game. Because I I naturally just want to get to know people, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. I, like, like you said, those down times to get to know people were the best times that I had. And so I think 
the perception was a lot different. And I think um, the audience response, obviously, I should have been a trader because you definitely get a bigger audience response than being a faithful. I, this is, these are just personal selfish questions I have for you. When, cause you have some really memorable, funny moments, like one, you know, my personal favorite, you're at the table and you're like, frankly, I just find you annoying. Like, is that you being real or are you like, all right, let me play this up a little bit for the camera. No, unfortunately that was really me being real. Like, <laughs> because you know, the thing, what it was with MJ, like, and this was stuff not even shot on camera, but like, she kept talking to me like she knew me because she knew somebody we knew. And she just like, was like, I was like, I don't remember meeting you. And she like, you know what I mean? And then like, she kept trying to like get more things out of me. And like, I, I was like, MJ, I have no idea what show you're on. I have no idea what you're talking about. And so she kept like repeating some of the things. Then like, you know, she was a little forgetful. I was like, yeah, I, I, we, we didn't meet, you know? And so like, I, I think it's just jet lag and just not, you know, have enough sleep. Wait, you had a mutual friend or you guys had actually met before? Yeah, I, I think it was both. I can't, you know, I'd have to quote MJ on this, but like, I, I just know she just kept talking to me and I was like, MJ, like. But you don't know if you'd met MJ before? You can't remember if you have? I can't remember, but I think she said we did, or we at least had mutual friends and then she kept talking about it. Like, you know, okay, like for instance, like if I were to be real, like I love Bergie now, but when I first met Bergie in the Jeep, I thought he was annoying because all he would do is talk about Love Island, you know, like. Everything related back to Love Island. I was like, what is up with this kid in Love Island? What is Love Island, you know? <laughs> I think I remember you saying something like that in the cast. Like, this dude only talks about Love Island. But I get it. He also just got off that. Like, didn't he, like, literally, I don't know if he exactly. stepped off the plane to go from one to another. Exactly. So now I understand it. So, like, now that I understand MJ a little bit more, I'm like, oh, she's not annoying. She's just, like, a reality TV queen, you know? <laughs> So, okay. So traders, your time on traders comes to, to an end. Do you have any regrets about it? Anything you wish you would have done different, anything you would have played it different or even like stuff you did on camera? I think the one thing I would have done different, Dan, is actually, um, I know eventually, uh, I, I think eventually I should have trusted one or two people, <laughs> like really trusted. Like I trusted the group I was in, but I didn't mm -hmm. trust individuals. You know what I mean? Um, I kind of wish I would have fell on to trusting one or two people more. In terms of, you know, I know we're like, we're, we're both biased now seeing the footage, but if you can going back without seeing footage and you were like, okay, gun to your head, you got to trust two people. Do you know who you would have leaned towards back then? Yeah, I would have trust uh, Trishel way more, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I also would have trusted Bergie a lot more. Like Bergie was actually much more sound reasoning than I anticipated. And I would have trusted him a lot more for sure. Got it. Uh, and I just, for the record, I thought like there's one thing that I saw you and Peter do early on about like faking that fight or whatever. And at the time it was just like a little confusing, but like the fact that you guys had planned that, I'm like, I thought that was pretty cool. Dan, I'm like, dude, I like that. Yeah. Dan, that confused me too at one point. Cause I'm like, Peter, are we still voting for each other tonight? Like, <laughs> Are we still voting for each other? What are we doing? Why are you talking to me right now? We're not supposed to like, you know, it confused the shit out of me too. I think it's cool that you guys did it because I that put for me, I'm like, okay, these guys don't really, there's some doubt when in reality it, there really wasn't, right? Like you guys were on the same team. But for me, that was like enough to be like, eh, maybe there's a riff there. Um, yeah, no, same team still worked out. <laughs> so as Traders has now like come to a wrap, we, we still have to shoot the reunion pretty soon here in the next day or two. Yeah um what are you working on now and what what are your your hopes to like the next couple steps for you man dan you would love this because uh i'm entering your world well not gaming so much but um i actually have i have a comic book original coming out with webtoon it's uh okay. one of the largest digital platforms for comic books um it's called tajin that i created and entering the comic book world my first love the nerd culture world again and um feeling right at home man what can you tell us about the comic? What was your role in it? How did it get started? Yeah, man, I'm the creator and it's based off of uh, a little childhood um, dream of mine, which is to have superhuman powers, but it's not superhero like, like mutants. 
it's based off of Chinese astrology and Batsa, where everybody has inherent super abilities anyway. Uh, you just have to learn how to untap it and harness it. So I, I, Webtoons and I are, are creating an original together, and it's supposed to be out somewhere in April. Um, and it's pretty cool. Like, I literally am entering the comic book world without meaning to. It was just something I loved, and I love talking about and creating. And then here we go. That's awesome. Are you, did you write it? Are you illustrating? Are you like the. No, I hired people to illustrate it. So I literally created the world, characters, setting, a lot of uh, the names and all the graphics and stuff. Like I still have to approve all that stuff, but it was, it was, it was a great experience. That's awesome. So that'll be out sometime in April. What's the best way we'll be able to find it or where can we keep in touch with you? It's, it's a, it's free to download. It's just on Webtoon. It's the app. Okay. So you can do an online comic book. Awesome. Is there anything else? I saw you guys, you had a trailer come out like past week or two. No, that was just, um, that, that, that's our, uh, life after, um, just a uh, mini scripted, unscripted uh, show that Damon and I are putting together just because we want to have um, our fans see what life is like and um, keep them updated in a kind of like a bling empire way. But we, we're, we're just doing it ourselves. So um, we want to awesome. keep people informed and also educated and uh, not educated, entertained with our life after. That's awesome. So comic books coming out uh, and then your life after that's on is on your YouTube Yep, just on YouTube. And like I said, we have a production company called All's Productions. We're going to do more of this um, comic books, entertainment, you name it, unscripted, scripted. We're doing it all. And and like this is this is not a bar, but like because I know you're coming from Hollywood, Hollywood. But when you say just YouTube, I'm like, man, YouTube is like YouTube. Like YouTube is I know. like. <laughs> but for you, it's I know like. I see. From your like Hollywood and TV, like do you look at YouTube in a different light, like not as serious or? Well, it's almost like this. It's like it. There's a conflict because YouTube, as an independent, you can make the most money. It's hands down you can, right? Uh, Hollywood, when you do Hollywood scripted or TV or even unscripted on Netflix, it definitely feels like the Rolls Royce. You know what I mean? Like you might not get the most bang for your buck, but like there's a certain premium about it that just feels so artistic and so professional. Um, I feel like YouTube is like, it doesn't mean it can't be, don't get me wrong. It's just that like, there's a barrier to entry that feels like it's not exclusive, if that makes sense. Yeah, we're like anyone can do YouTube, but I get it, yes. Not everybody can do Netflix, you know? I understand. Not everybody can do Peacock. (laughs) <laughs> Kevin, so where are you most active on social media and where can people follow you? Where you spend the most time? Yeah, mostly Instagram and also now doing TikTok and our YouTube channel. It's uh, All's Productions. And you can also find me on Kevin period Kreider on all the channels. Awesome. Kevin, thanks so much for taking time out to be here, man. It's a great catching up and can't wait to see you in a couple of days. You too, man. I'll see you. I'll see you in my neck of the woods. <laughs> all right, Kevin. I'll see you, man.